Hey, it's Mike here, and today the vegan diet, just the entire diet has been debunked by High Intensity Health, a low carb YouTube channel that I have responded to before, and you guys asked me to respond, so here we are. Hey friends, welcome back. In today's show, we're gonna debunk the myth that vegan and vegetarian diets are healthy for humans. We'll have a debunk of a debunk, and he makes some of the familiar claims around vitamins and muscle loss from a lack of animal protein and eating disorders and depression, but then, then some unique ones like how plant-based athlete rich rolls joints are deteriorating from a lack of animal-based collagen as well as some other claims so let's just go i want to read you some stats and figures and not come at this from a biased perspective because i am an omnivore but i want to share with you some data and facts because i know a lot of you like science yes he says that despite being a meat eater he's going to come at this from an unbiased perspective uh but as you will soon see he pretty much is only biased he i think probably makes 99 negative claims toward veganism and the closest we get to a positive one is that like more women are vegan because they're more empathetic toward animals. So we're gonna lean on some science from a paper titled Debunking the Vegan Myth by prominent authors like Lauren Cordain. He just wants to focus on some unbiased science yet immediately whips up and pretty much the whole video relies on a paper by Lauren Cordain, the founder of the low carb paleo diet who has been anti-vegan from the start. There are known health consequences when you go on a vegan or vegetarian diets. And let's talk about some of these, including depression and anxiety. All right, ding, ding, ding. We're starting off with the depression topic here. And you know, up until more recently, we've had vegetarians and vegans just lumped together here. And the studies have also been funded by the meat industry directly. And the result has been like less meat, more sadness. And before we hit on a recent study that really changes that and targets vegans that I've mentioned recently. Uh, yeah, he goes and says that our increase in depression as a society you know, appears to be from our increase in plant-based diet. This is something that we see so much uh, in our culture today, suicides drug overdoses. We have people now, I think it's like 30% of postmenopausal women are on psychiatric medications. We know kids are now taking polypharmacy when it comes to amphetamines and antidepressants. And we know that more and more people are plant-based than ever. It's like being like depression has gone up and so has the number of people dying their hair blue. Therefore, a blue hair dye must cause depression. I don't even need to tell you that the vast majority of depressed people in society are not on a plant-based diet. Anyway, this recent study that actually did compare vegans to vegetarians specifically and meat eaters all separately did find that vegans had the lowest rates of depression and anxiety scores. And get this, for the depressive symptom score, vegans were down at 11. If you're over 16, it could mean depression. And the average meat eater was over 16. The study says, quote, the mean omnivore score is above the cutoff criterion score of 16, indicating possible experiences of depressive symptoms for this dietary pattern. And finally, the anxiety score was 45% lower in the vegans. Just thought we would put some of that in information out there. Also to throw another plant-based wrench in his gears, we have this 2021 study which found that red meat was associated with about a 43% increased risk of depression symptoms when looking at high versus low consumption. But really most importantly, you can't point to a unique vegan depression risk when the best vegan specific study we have shows the exact opposite. Anyway, he points back to the Lauren Cordain chart here saying that in particular nutrients like a low omega intake could be causing depression in vegans. And as you can see here in figure two, that is elucidated by why? The micronutrient deficiencies like omega-3 fatty acid deficiencies. But there's a study here that shocked even me because I figured omegas are probably good for depression, whether they are fish-based or the shorter plant-based ones. But no, from the Nurses Health Study looking at 55,000 people, the fish-based omegas were not associated with lower depression, but the plant-based ALA omega-3s were associated with lower depression. Hair loss. I see more and more people now with thinning or balding hair in both men and women. We know that protein deficiencies, zinc deficiencies, and iron deficiencies he sees more people with thinning hair just in general. Is he still tying just like 
all of society's problems to some increase in plant-based diets. Or he's probably talking about vegans here, but he's just going anecdote city. And yeah, low consumption of calories and nutrients on any diet could lead to hair thinning. And he actually points to PCOS here, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which yes, your testosterone can be higher in women, which can lead to some androgenic alopecia or hair loss. Well, let's just go anecdote to anecdote. Here is a woman who went on a vegan diet and says, quote, my cysts on my ovaries disappeared. No, she was less tired, skin cleared up, etc., And my hair was growing thin. Thicker. But I have a whole video actually covering the risk factors for PCOS and the connection to diet. The first one is how insulin has a huge role and vegans have lower levels of insulin resistance and lower levels of diabetes. And also those advanced glycation end products, which come from various foods, but you know, mostly from animal products in the diet. And a recent Neil Bernard randomized control trial found that the intake of advanced glycation end products on a vegan diet was lowered by 73%. The study was actually looking at hot flashes and on that vegan diet, severe and moderate hot flashes both went down by about 90%, huge. And we see hypothyroidism is very common amongst vegans and vegetarians. Very common with the confidence he says that with, you would think that there is a particular study he's thinking about. Nope, he's just literally pulling this out of thin air. And I really think there's a danger with that statement we see because it sounds kind of official, but it's just, completely anecdotal and not science related, but we do actually have some studies on this topic. Not only do vegans have 50% lower rates of hyperthyroidism, which is insanely huge. From this study, they saw about a 22% lower rate of hypothyroidism and quote, in conclusion, a vegan diet tended to be associated with lower, not higher risk of hypothyroid disease. Though that was just a trend, it wasn't statistically significant, but still better than we see. And today's video is sponsored by Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic, and today's theme is doggos and their beneficial bacteria. And this is Diego, who you've seen skittering in the back of my videos. But first, this little probiotic pill contains 53.6 billion active bacterial cell units from 24 different strains, which are scientifically shown to support gut immunity and gut barrier, digestive health, heart health, skin health, and more. And now to doggos. Yes, they have been shown to increase the microbial diversity of the gut in multiple studies. And it makes sense. I mean, just look at Diego's little paws there in the grass collecting all those microbes. Well, this 2017 study in the journal Microbiome found that early childhood, quote, exposure to pets increased the abundance of two bacteria, Ruminococcus and Oscillospira, which have been negatively associated with childhood allergy-based diseases and obesity. We also have this 2022 study from PLOS One in elderly people where pets also helped and men saw the most benefit for some reason. Lindy and I have been taking seed for over two years now and we love it. And also Diego is coincidentally about two years old. And since you know this bacterial road is probably a two way street, I wonder if any of those seed strains have made it to him. And of course, if you'd like to try seed, you can click the link below and use the code Mike, that's M-I-C for 25% off your first month's order. Thank you and say goodbye, Diego. One important point that we need to really expand upon here is sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass. If you're not getting adequate protein or insufficient amino acids, uh, such as leucine, isoleucine, valine, and essential amino acids that are not present in plants, you're going to have impairments in muscle protein synthesis. Eric, you just lost all of your credibility, your channel, your YouTube channel, just delete it, delete it. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm pretty sure that he misspoke here. Yes, plants contain all of the essential amino acids. You know, this is a cup of black beans. Look at all those essential amino acids. Here is a cup of soybeans, which is even better, which is why people are obsessed with soy. I mean, come on. Often when you go to a grocery store, you see people that are buying clearly on a, a plant-based diet. Oftentimes there's a lot of cookies, crackers, treats, and bread products. <laughs> I saw a vegan at the grocery store with bread in their cart. Yeah, I obviously do advocate for vegans to eat a whole food vegan diet. I mean, it's right there on my cookbook, you know, actually including legumes and whole grains, etc. That would be awesome. We've spoken a lot about the importance of prioritizing protein to help support muscle protein synthesis. But looking to the data, this study, which looked at older adults who are worse at making new muscle, 
found that plant versus animal protein, it didn't matter as long as people got enough. Muscle mass was the same. And we have more recent studies showing that a vegan diet in particular did not result in lower muscle mass. We have this very recent one from Exeter that looked at some athletes even, and they found that there was no difference in the muscle mass between groups. Now these were two groups, vegan and non-vegan, that were matched for strength at the beginning and then put on a workout regimen. And there was no difference in muscle mass or muscle protein synthesis, as you can see from this chart, though the vegans trended slightly higher. The only difference between all the groups was that vegans improved more in their incline bench press. No, so muscle gaining is looking better for vegans in a controlled trial environment. But I do have to mention that this study was funded by the parent company of Quarren Vegan Product. However, they didn't design the study and Exeter is a very prestigious university, so I doubt they'd just flub it. So again, if you're going vegan or vegetarian because it's purportedly less inflammatory or better for longevity and such, yeah, reportedly this randomized control trial put people on a vegan diet and after just a pretty short period of time, their C-reactive protein major inflammation marker dropped by 30%. And that report, air quotes, is higher on the hierarchy of scientific evidence than any claim he makes in his entire video. Only 6% of Americans are metabolically healthy. 94.8% some odd uh, of Americans are metabolically unhealthy. Part of that is due to insulin resistance and loss of skeletal muscle. So I think this is one of the biggest risk factors with a vegan and vegetarian diet. It's super ironic to quote metabolic health against vegan diets. Going to this study, which I'm 90% sure is the one he's talking about, 6.8% of people are metabolically healthy, it found. Well, looking to what it defines as metabolically healthy, it's talking about risk factors such as healthy levels of weight, blood pressure, glucose, lipids, and clinical cardiovascular disease. Yeah, all of these are areas that vegans crush it in. Yeah, studies on US vegans show that they average normal BMI, unlike other dietary groups. You know, high blood pressure rates are 50 to 75% lower depending on what study you're looking at, and then just blood sugar and diabetes related things vegans destroy in, like 78% lower risk from the Adventist study. No, their cholesterol levels completely destroy are amazing, and finally they have lower levels of cardiovascular disease. So he is completely wrong to bring this up here. And I can't help but wonder what percent of vegans would be considered metabolically healthy. Looking at these categories though, if I had to guess, I'd probably say between 50 and 75% of vegans are metabolically healthy when over 90% of meat eaters are not. But be afraid of going vegan because of metabolic health. And again, I'm just sharing with you the data, okay? I am a little bit biased because I'm an omnivore, but I think that any vegan or vegetarian should know this information. I guess omnivores would theoretically pick cherries as well, but then he's going further and telling you that it's, it's a tomato. Like he's just so far off base here. Anyway, moving on. And last but not least, the two major additional health risks linked with vegan and vegetarian diets are osteoporosis and bone fractures due to vitamin D insufficiency and calcium insufficiencies as well as various anemias due to iron deficiency, as well as B12 deficiencies. I've gone over this so many times, the modern studies are showing that B12 levels and deficiency rates are not worse in vegans, study after study. And I have an entire video on the bone health aspect. If you're really interested, you should just watch that. But I believe that it's BMI related, some adjustment issues perhaps because any vegan over a BMI of 22 didn't have a higher fracture risk as well as other issues with the studies. But the next, as well as other issues with the studies, next he goes on to just all vegans fail. A very strong rate of attrition when it comes to vegan and vegetarian diets, meaning there are five times more former vegan and vegetarians than current vegans and vegetarians. Now, why is that? The mental health issues, gastrointestinal issues, anemia, and much more. So he's saying that this is due to health issues. First of all, I just have to mention that we don't live in a vegan world. We live in a meat-based world. The failure rate of trying to eat meat in a vegan world would probably be even higher. You know, everything is stacked against vegans. Thankfully, it's becoming less that way. Then we have to look to this recent Faunalytics paper, which found that the main reason for vegans quitting was not health. It was actually dissatisfaction with food, which once again plays to vegan food availability and probably like addiction to high fat animal products. And a lot of people quit for social reasons. They're just tired of going against the grain. Anyway, he makes some mortality claims, but to speed it up for you, he promotes a low carb diet 
which meta-analysis after meta-analysis shows is associated with about a 30% increased risk of all-cause mortality. So he cannot be talking here. Yet we see the Adventist vegans trending at like 15% lower mortality. So the co-occurrence of eating disorders in vegans or vegetarians is much higher compared to non-vegetarians. Um, so that's important to recognize. He points to this chart from the Cordain study. Pretty much everything he's saying here is from the Cordain paper. And it's just on vegetarians. It doesn't particularly look at vegans. So I'll just counter it with this study right here that is particularly on vegans from 2017. Yeah, vegans scored significantly lower than omnivores on the eating disorder questionnaire, which was measuring pathological eating behaviors. Yeah, vegans scored lower on several metrics, including focusing on just eating in general too much, which is funny because I thought vegans had to work so hard to even figure out what they're eating at all. And then he starts talking about collagen, you need collagen, you eat the whole animal and all the, the organs and crap, and starts going on about rich roll, actually, including a pretty long clip in there. He's reporting in his 50s, he's having a lot of joint pain, a lot of issues. He can barely ride his bike anymore, and he used to be an avid cyclist like myself. Through my own experience of, of dealing with lower back pain, Suddenly I'm in a position where I can't run without pain. And even if I'm on the bike for more than a couple hours, my back becomes intolerable. I've got an L4 that's kind of out of whack. If you're not aware, Rich Roll started out like this. He was a depressed business dude who then became like an ultra vegan marathoner and looks incredible. He's over 50 years old. I know a lot of people who have some joint issues over 50 years old, but it's pretty clear to me, you know, to nutshell it, that he was saying that he was having these joint issues because he wasn't working in a balanced way in the gym and preparing for training properly. But I wasn't doing any of the kind of gym work required to be balanced in that regard. He wasn't like, yeah, I'm having major disc degeneration, which is something that we see now in American children. And it goes up and up and up, likely from clogged arteries that feed your cartilage in your back due to animal fat. It's just funny to take somebody who's like a walking example of how amazing a plant-based diet can be. And then they're like, I've, I've been having some back pain. It's like, that's it. <laughs> a vegan diet has been debunked. He's having a lot of issues. And I think we're seeing more and more of that uh, in the community when, where people are having joint pain and challenges, probably because they're not getting collagen and hydroxy collagen and the different collagen like peptides from eating a nose to tail animal based omnivorous style diet. Not enough collagen peptide. I wonder if he's saying peptides because he may know that collagen itself is like 900 amino acids long, but the human body can only absorb chains of like three to five amino acids, which are those peptides. So if you're going to be getting animal peptides, you're already going to be taking a highly processed food supplement, or you can even get that same collagen peptide from a plant-based source from vegan collagen, which you may have seen on the market, though it's unlikely that any of it is really going to help. And I would suggest if you're interested in this, reading this article by a statistician on the research on this topic, which is really on a $1.8 billion industry and a bunch of industry funded studies. I'll link that one below. Because humans are omnivores. Now really quickly, I don't really care about this that much. If we can survive on a plant-based diet, I don't really care what we ate, but we clearly can be healthy on a fully herbivorous diet. That's all that matters to me. However, there was a claim they made here that I had really not heard before, and that is this one. Like carnivores, we have assorted proteases in our gut that are designed specifically to digest animal protein. From the paper, notice that there's no citation there, probably because it's an opinion piece by a low carber. I went way too deep down the rabbit hole trying to find what this protease that is animal specific that he was talking about and could not find it. And proteases are just enzymes that break apart protein. We have pepsin which is very basic, obviously digest plants. We have trypsin, which targets amino acids, arginine and lysine, but those are in plants. And then we have chymotrypsin, which is again, some other amino acids also in plants. The only one I can think of that they would have mistakenly thought was animal specific is elastase. And that's because it does break down collagen. However, from the NIH quote, elastase helps break down fats, proteins and carbohydrates after you eat. Obviously carbs aren't animals. I mean, horses or herbivores have elastase. So I'm concluding that this is a pseudoscientific claim, but if I missed something, feel free to let me know in the comments. 
And there's so many more points that he makes in his quite long video and, you know, benefits of a vegan diet that he just completely doesn't mention. You know, like the 15% lower cancer risk from this meta-analysis, which is likely connected to the larger antioxidant content. And there's just, I, I have a whole channel about the benefits. That being said, a vegan diet isn't perfect. People will still get sick on a vegan diet, but it's, it's quite clear that all of his attacks essentially backfired. There was at least some conflicting information directly <laughs> against what he was saying, and really at worst, just him being completely upside down on it, like in terms of metabolic health. But he was really quite wrong in the areas of hypothyroidism, PCOS risk factors, eating disorders, depression, and protein, and on and on. And finally, of course, if you would like to try Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic, you can click the link below and use the code Mike for 25% off your first month's supply. And of course, let me know down below what you think about that video. If there was anything that I missed you want me to cover, I'll just do a comment response perhaps. And of course, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.